May I say thank you to this congregation by reading one verse of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. This is not the text, but will you hear me as I read it? The Apostle Paul had been down to a little town called Thessalonica and planted a congregation of people, and I write them a letter and says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because, now listen carefully, when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, it was God's word, but you had to hear it from us. When you did that, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. This is solemn, Brother Jackson, the little old tadpole preacher like you. You have to preach in the way. And it's God's truth. And people that hear it is God's truth. And if you want to hear God's truth, that's the only way you can hear it. But you didn't receive it as Brother Jackson's opinion or the way Brother Barnard looked at it, but you received it not as the word of men, but it as it is in truth, the word of God. Yet it came through human lips, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I've seen miracle after miracle these years. Oh, poor preacher like me up a popping off and somebody hears from God. Amen. Yeah, God speaks to them. Isn't that a blessed, blessed chapter? I wish I lived in Houston, if I had a way to make a living, I believe I'd move out here. Yeah, I'd love to be a member of this church. It's a million miles away from a real church yet, but you've got a pastor with open mind, you've got an open book, and the desperateness of the hour is going to drive us to start paying some attention to the Scripture. And I, I thank God for this church extension of this dear man, you people. You see, you haven't got a church unless if you've got a hundred members, visitation night, working conditions and sickness and so forth being equal, you got a hundred out doing visitation. Is that right? You haven't got a real church unless... Uh, when it's time to pray and intercede, you've got a hundred members. Other than being equal, you've got a hundred people on that face of poor God. No such thing as being a member of the Lord's church, letting somebody else do the praying and the visiting and the giving and all of that, you see. You see what I mean? But you're on the way. And I rejoice. There are not many churches making as much progress as I felt here, and I thank God for it. Thank God for it. You know, God's people all over the country, the reason I believe God's going to reveal this church, bring it together right here on this earth. God's people are suffering like I am. I live in a city of 120,000 people. I'm not under the authority of my church because I don't have any. I haven't been able to attend one of its services in over nine months. Of course, I'm on the road. But if I were there, wouldn't I be in a pickle? And I'm under deep conviction about that. You can do just as you please and be a deacon. When the service is over, they have to dismiss between Sunday school and church. So the deacons and the Sunday school teachers and the men stand out in front and smoke between preaching and uh, some to look like a smokestack. Uh, the women, the pastor, prayed to visit because the women will come half naked to the door, his own church members. You see, the, the showing of our flesh is a denial that we're sinners. Did you know that? Something deeply involved there. And uh, you can attend church or not, still be a member. They have 2,000 members when they have the Lord's Supper. They average 400 at the Lord's Supper. It's an insult not to be at the Lord's Supper if you're a member. Of course, if you're a member, at one time you'd sure be here. 
So we got a lot to work on. And, and but I believe you work in that direction. Brother, if there's anything going on in this church, you're not under the authority of this church, it means that you are part of that under discipline. You're just a spectator. You're not a member. You're not a member. God bless you. But so many of you seem to have heard. I thank God for you. And I do look forward, if it be the Lord will. I thank you so much for inviting me back, and it's so nice of you. The average preacher won't invite me for a meeting unless he's so desperate about to get fired or something. He thinks maybe I can keep him from getting fired. <laughs> ah, it's been so good, but I must bring you a message from God's Word. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank the Tyners for being in their home. They've been so good, and I've come to love them deeply, and I could just go on and on and on. Will you turn tonight in the book of Acts at chapter 2 and verse 40? Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. And I wish to read a text for the evening and then look at it in the context for a while. Verse 40. Acts chapter 2. And with many other words did he testify and exhort And his testimony and his exhortation was this, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Amen. That's the summation of the sermon on the day of Pentecost, the model sermon, first time the church preached the sermon. Peter stood up with the eleven. I'm as dead certain as I'm standing here tonight that the only voice God has in this world now is not the voice of the individual, but the voice of the body of Christ, the church. There can be no salvation apart from being united with this church. There is this We must come back to it. Here is God speaking to the church, which is his body. And a message is brought. 3,000 souls are stabbed inside of them. They ask a question. The question is answered. And the summation of the answer of the apostle Peter as the eleven stood up with him, all of it can be summed up in the word. Spit on your hands. Get the wax out of your ears. Save yourself from this untoward generation. This is the watchword to every generation. As I hope to show you tonight, this one in which we live faces exactly the same thing, the people to whom Peter addressed the word. It is the command and the invitation and the charge of a loving God to every human being in every generation. Run for dear life. Get out of it. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Here's an excited preacher with many other words. Did he testify to what he'd seen, what he'd heard, whom he'd seen, rather, and whom he'd heard? And he exhorted, roll 
up his sleeve like an old free Methodist exhorter. The old time churches. You got old enough to have a little sense, you know. You remember when they had exhorters, don't you? Somebody preached, and then old Deacon Jones would get up and exhort. I remember. His name slipped me now, the young English evangelist Charlie Taylor. He'd get up and preach like a house of fire. And then he liked me. He didn't know how to give an invitation, didn't want to learn. And his old 76-year-old daddy would get up and exhort. He'd say, I beg you in Christ's name. I plead with you. I warn you. I charge you. Peter did both. He testified the facts and experiences in the person. And then he said, I beg you. I charge you. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Save yourself. Judgment's coming. Right. Judgment's coming. It isn't but a little while until the armies of Titus surround that city, until the people have to sustain themselves by eating the flesh of their own children. Right. Judgment did come. Here's an excited preacher. God give us a school here. We won't have it here. God give us one somewhere. There isn't one in America that's got some truth to stand on and will baptize it in the enthusiasm of a holy, holy, holy fear of the terror of God. The Apostle Paul said, Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men. Because we know the terror of the Lord. And Peter was all excited. I can hear him. When uh, you folks complain, I don't talk loud enough. I hurt so bad. And I get up with the Yankees. They say you talk too loud. They like everything nice and quiet and dead. But the old Peter, brother, you couldn't keep him quiet. He said, I tell you right now, get up, fat boy. This thing's on fire. Judgment's coming. Hell's going to slip wide open. The heavens are going to be open. God's going to bring his judgment on this generation. Save yourself. Save yourself. Save yourself. Woodrow Wilson walking down the street while he's president. And he's noticed smoke coming out of a house. And he went over there to the president, rang the doorbell, knocked on the door. And directly here came a nice little lady. And she said, oh, Mr. President, how honored I am to have you come to see me. Come in and have a cup of tea. He said, I didn't come to have a cup of tea. I came to tell you a house on fire. My soul, my Lord came down here on urgent business, brother. Oh, here's an excited preacher. Give us excited men and women. I mean it, brother, if the visitation program of this church is of God and you are not in it, you better get right with God. We need an urgency. Brother, there's enough teeming thousands of people in the reach of this congregation that if every member of this church were a member of this church, you couldn't begin to start to come in to get the blood of sinners off your hands. An excited preacher. Brother, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Hell's a popping. Judgment's coming. The wrath of God's hanging over your head. Save yourself. Save yourself. And bless God, there were some excited people too. They kind of got excited when they heard Peter preaching. When they heard him preaching, they said, My soul, my soul, what must we do? Men and brethren, what must we do? Must be our move there. You mean tell me we just got to hang around and let judgment fall? What must we do? Oh, my soul, nothing to argue about now, honey. Tell me, preacher. Tell me, you apostles, is anything in God's world I can do? What must we do? It's urgent. Hell's breath is catching up the flames of lichen. What must we do? And he told In the summation of his telling, he described in our text, all he said can be summed up. We'll look at it in a minute. Save yourself. Save yourself from this untoward generation. You're not a tin can. The fact that you can't believe doesn't rob you of the responsibility of it. The 
fact that you can't repent, you're still commanded to. God help your soul, brother. You're responsible to God to obey his command. Listen to me. It's high time somebody got a law. It's high time somebody got a law. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare for battle? Woo! It's high time for everyone that names the name of Christ to get a liar. This generation going to hell to pass is climbing over one another's backs to do so. There never was such a rapid pace on the road to hell inside our organized churches and now as today. This is the time for a lie. Here are some people who were stabbed in the hearts and they got alarmed. They got alarmed and they asked the question, what must we do? These were some people who were faced with two things. And when they looked them squarely in the eye, they had to. For Peter preached them, and Christ was real, and the Holy Ghost did the stabbing. These people looked at two facts. And every generation, you included, are called upon in every generation by every voice of from Almighty God to face once again these two age-old facts. First, these men and women were confronted by, they were faced with the fact that they had with wicked hands crucified and slain the Lord of glory. The book of Acts reads with just two things. First, you with wicked hands with malice of forethought. Your motive was bad. With wicked hands, you've taken him, nailed him to a tree. Yeah. Men of the Lord's day were guilty of taking the Prince of Glory, nailing his hands and feet to a tree. Sticking that tree in a hole between two other trees on which two seeds hung. Ladies and gentlemen, when they were faced with the fact of who it was they had hung on a tree, no wonder some of them said, Is there any hope? What must we do? Now here we get in a little of the mystery of the Bible, but the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible, it is said of him, he was as a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. There never was a time when in the heart and purpose of God the lovely Lord Jesus wasn't hanging up there on the tree. And that's so now in the heart of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the scripture is dead certain to teach what I'm saying now as I'm standing here. Every generation deals with Christ just exactly like his day. You had just as much a part in the nailing of the Lord of glory to Calvary's cross as anybody that lived there. 
your pastor will back me up. I do not understand what I'm going to preach. But the scriptures teach when Adam rebelled against God, you were there. He didn't rebel in your stead. You were there. Back down in the garden, I can hear the voice of Brother C. O. Jackson, Sr. Screaming out to God, get off that throne. I'm going to sit there. Somebody said he didn't think that God ought to punish a man for Adam's sin. He ain't going to punish it for you. Every human being here me tonight is guilty of two sins. I don't know whether it's so bad to charter back and get drunk and rob a bank or not. You can argue if you want to while you're going to hell. But there's two things you dead show guilty of, brother, that I know of. One is when you were in your father's loins, and the book of Romans says you were there, brother, and you sinned there, and you acted there. I don't explain it. I just believe it. I just believe I know, brother, your voice joined the rebellion there. Yours were the hands that tried to push God off his throne and say, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm running my life. And I know another sin you're guilty of, Mr. Man. I can hear your voice now. Listen, listen, listen. I can hear it. Away with it! Away with it! Release unto us Barabbas and crucify Christ. Oh, uh, it may not be so bad to go to the picture show, but it sure is bad to push God off the throne or try it in Eden and nail him to a cross at Golgotha's hill, and you guilty, brother. There won't be anybody in heaven except men who've been pardoned from the high crime of rebellion against the throne rights of God. Pardoned from the awful sin of nailing but stained Jesus to a cross. Right, right. My soul, honey, listen. If the Holy Spirit's ever pleased to present you with that, maybe you cry out, What must I do? Those men were faced with the second fact that you're faced with tonight. They were faced with what God did in response to the wicked actions of men who nailed the Lord of glory to a cross. Let's read what it says here. You know what God did? This Jesus hath God raised up. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, this same Jesus, you killed him. But God raised him, and now he shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but David did say himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. How long? Until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, therefore, let all the house of Israel know as a matter of fact, that God hath made that same Jesus, what part do you have in it, whom ye've crucified? You know what God's done about that? He's taken the one you crucified and made him Lord and Christ. Amen. And when they heard this, that they killed the Prince of Glory, God raised him and exalted him and made him Lord. When they heard this, they said, what must we do? You'll never cry out, what must we do, unless the Holy Spirit makes this real to you. We're praying he'll do it for somebody tonight. He still does. And when, 
God exalted his son, put him on the throne. He turned all judgment over to him. John chapter 5. And he gave him authority to execute judgment. He's got you on his hand. And he's under commission from the Father to save you or damn you. If you get saved, he'll save you. If you are sent to hell, he'll send you there. That's his commission. You're on his hand. When they face that, they cried out. Ladies and gentlemen, you live in a day of rebellion. Because lawlessness shall abound rebellion in the home, in the school, in the church, everywhere. The love of many shall wax cold. We're going to separate the men from the boys, the saved from the professors. And it'll be separated at the point of bowing to or shaking your fist at authority. You're living in the day of lawless rebellion against every claim of Almighty God. And judgment's going to strike this generation. Save yourself from the judgment that's coming. Well, how can we do that, Peter? What must we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, unto the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How long that last, Peter? The promise is unto you. The promise, grace upon grace, and unto your children, that you can't repent for them. And to all whom our God shall call at last down to the day. We hope somebody heard God speak this morning. Look like he did. So it's up to date. Gracious promise. Repent and be baptized. Repentance means to agree with God's answer. What did he do? He raised that fellow you killed and declared him to be the Son of God and put him on a throne and turned everything over to him. And repentance is for you to agree with God and throw down your rebellion and worship him and love him and serve him where he is on a throne. Baptism. Baptism means to come under the authority of this wonderful Lord as he is the head of the church. If you are scripturally baptized this next Wednesday night, that means that you are under the absolute authority of this church. You're not a spectator. You are in it. You're under it, boy. Brother, that's it. That's it. Oh, I started my mission here with you by begging you to become a seeker. Seek him who can work repentance and faith. Seek him who can bend and break and bruise and crush you until you'll be made willing to gladly receive the word. Throwing down my shotgun and bowing to King Jesus where he is there and where he is here. In the church. That's it. That's it. 
I'm 60 years old this last August. I preached my old fool heart out. I counted up this afternoon, trying to get a little rest and pain. I've made exactly one million, 527,211 and a half mistakes. But they were mistakes because I ain't got no sin. I wish I hadn't made so many. But all oh, my soul, I've been trying where I've gone. I've done it here to be true to your soul. I don't know whether I'll get back in June or not. Lots of things can happen between now and then. I don't know where you'll be in June. I don't know where I'll be. But I'll see you at the judgment. And I'll have to witness against everybody I've ever seen. say leper. You and he'll not be satisfied with anything except you. All that tomfoolery about giving your talents to the Lord for you. He can take an old cross-cut saw and a hillbilly farm and make better music. <clears throat> it's, it's crowned with his glory. And you can if you go to all the school. He don't want your talent. You ain't got none. He said, well, I'm going to give the Lord a little of my time. All right, it ain't yours to, to give it. But he made the journey and gave himself to get you. He didn't send us some advice. He came down here where we were. This is a bad old world, but there's one mighty happy thing about it. You know something, folks? Don't you tell anybody. You're living on, in a world that's been visited by God Almighty. He came down here, tabernacled among us, wrote among us. God did. Woo! Boy. Amen. John says some of us beheld his glory. It was full of grace and truth. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Ladies and gentlemen, it cost him himself. And it'll cost you yourself. This little decision and attending church on Sunday morning and not killing anybody that don't amount to much and robbing only little banks and cutting out a few of your vices and honoring God with your presence now and then going to send you to hell. It's an all-out response. Nothing short of it. The Jesus man went and preached to the missionaries out in Oklahoma. I lived in Tulsa 14 years. Our headquarters, my wife, is an Oklahomaite. And uh, you know that crazy fellow, Tyner, he's a doctor me last night. And I told him that my wife with her foster mother left Oak Mug, Oklahoma, yesterday morning to journey back to Winston-Salem. He said, how far is it? I said, 1,200 miles from Oak Mulgee to Winston-Salem. That was last night. He said, well, I expect they're there by now, going in a Ford. I don't see how he ever got sense enough to teach Sunday school class. <laughs> well, I talk like that. <laughs> but uh, he said he'd be glad and I left. Next week, all he got to do is go to school all morning, work eight hours, Thank that boy three or four times. And he said he'd get some rest next week from having to rub me. But the Jesus man went and preached to the Indians. And the old chieftain heard him. He kept on hearing him. 
And he kept on hearing. Finally, one day, the old chieftain came out of his wigwam, and he had his prize hunting rifle with him. And he took it to the Jesus man and said, Here, Jesus man, you've been telling me what Jesus do for me, what he gave for me. Me bring my rifle. Me give my rifle to Jesus. And the Jesus man said, No, no, chief, he don't want your rifle. He won't take it. The old chieftain said, Jesus, no, want my rifle? No, he won't take it. Greatly perplexed, he made his way back to his wigwam, but he kept on listening to the Jesus man. A few days later, he got the dearest possession, material possession on earth he had. He got his prized moccasins, and he waxed them and greased them and shined them, and like a little girl with a doll, he cradled him in his arms, and he approached the Jesus man, and he said, Here, Jesus man, and he been listening. You tell me what Jesus do for me and what he gave for me. And he bring my hunting rifle, and he say, Me give it to Jesus. You say, Jesus, no one, he won't take. Now me bring my moccasins, me give them to Jesus. And the Jesus man said, No, chief. Jesus don't want your moccasins. He won't take them. And greatly perplexed, he made his way back, and for five days didn't come back to the meetings, thinking, thinking, thinking. And then he emerged from his wigwam, came into the presence of the Jesus man, and said, Here, Jesus man, me bring my hunting rifle and say, Me give it to Jesus, because what he did for me, you said, Jesus won't take. Me bring my moccasins. And you say, Jesus won't take. Me bring me. He'll settle for you. But not a little of your time. Not a little of your love. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. This morning, will you let me exhort just a little while and give you three very simple reasons why you ought, before you're forced to at the judgment, because you'll have to then, you ought under God's mercy and grace, here in a heathen atmosphere, where the very breath of hostility to Christ can be felt, felt you ought now, you ought now, to take yourself and just cast yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, Here I am, Lord, and crown him with yourself utterly surrendered to him and his claim on your life. And first reason you ought to do that is he's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. He'll do the ride the river with. 